Um, we have a great speaker here today, you know, as we talk about disrupting the pipeline, as we talk about interrupting all of these kind of myriad uh, disparities that impact our community and impact our society. Um, I'm pleased to present uh, and introduce, um, well, to present, most of you I think know her, uh, somebody who has been passionately act active uh, in working on all of those issues for a really long time. Uh, Patricia Brady. Um, has been employed in Ramsey County for over 12 years as a director of Workforce Solutions. She is the first African American person to serve as a uh, department director, as a department head for the Ramsey County government. Um, and she has been um, uh, it's the administrative entity of the city and county workforce development program operating under the authority of the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners and in partnership with the city of St. Paul. Patricia Brady. Don't know all of you. I do see some fa faces out there that I do know, but I, I, I really want to start by telling these young people that you're just absolutely amazing, and all of my mother's children were the same color. <laughs> we didn't have any colorism in our house, so I, it's, um, you know, it's really interesting to actually see um, that we're talking about those things now. So that, that's really good. So, um, you know, uh, for uh, uh, the, if the mayor's office is present, city council members are present, I'd like to say um, I thank you for this opportunity to speak to all of you on this wonderful occasion of celebrating African American History Month. This is something that we must continue to do. It's our legacy, and when we stop celebrating it, we start forgetting where we came from. And there were wonderful men and women who stepped into a raging sea of pain to get us to where we are today. And so symbolically, I pour out a libation to those brothers and sisters for what they did to make a day like today possible for all of us. Today I'm going to talk about solidarity, and not from just a purely social point of view, but actually sort of a personal um, point of view. Samara Mikkel, who was the first president of Mozambique, describes solidarity this way. He says, it's an act of unity between allies fighting on different terrains towards the same object. I like that, don't you? You can be on different terrains, but you can stand together in solidarity and fight same thing. So I show up in the world and there is still room for me to be me and to support people who are different than I am, who have a different perspective, but whose rights may also be disenfranchised from them. Um, Aurora Levins Morales, a Puerto Rican Jewish writer, uh, says that solidarity comes from the inability to tolerate the affront to our own integrity of passive or active collaboration in the, in the presence of others. Now I'm going to repeat that again because I, I don't want you to miss one word of that because this is about you and it is about me and it is about everybody else. Solidarity comes from the inability to tolerate the affront to our own integrity of passive or active collaboration in the oppression of others. And I just love that because it really speaks the truth. So solidarity demands that we all have an underlying sense that we are all equal, that we are all human, we may look different, we may have different colors and different backgrounds, but what we share is the most important thing of all. We share humanity. We share the ability to love one another. We've already got solidarity around a lot of things that we may not have thought about it in that may not have thought about it in that way. For instance, can't you recognize the compassion that we all have around beached whales? If a whale is beached, we are rooting for the people to keep the whale wet until the tide comes in and brings it back out. We despise child abuse, elder abuse, and elder neglect. Those are things around which our society already has solidarity. And dare anybody to try to take that away from us. I first came to the notion of solidarity uh, by observing its wrong-headed direction in, in maintaining the status quo. The conspiracy of, of people to unwittingly engage in that which prevents someone else from having the best that they can have. 
In my first year of college, I used to fly home every other Friday. It's because I was a mama's girl. Uh, it was hard for me to be there without her, and so they paid for me to fly every other Friday back home. Um, I took the same flight, ate at the same diner, um, had the same meal, grilled cheese and a pop, uh, and waited for my flight. On this particular occasion, however, I had cut my hair into an afro. I wasn't wearing it straight. I had cut my hair into an afro, which to me was a hairstyle. But to those in the diner, it signaled militancy, hatred of white people, rebellion, all of those things, none of which was what I stood for. But that is what they saw. And um, it occurred to me as I was running late that something was wrong, but I really just didn't know what it was. But then I looked around the room at the white faces that were staring at me. Waitresses leaning against the walls and wondering how long it was going to take this naive teenager to figure out that no lunch was coming to her today. The other patrons already knew it. I could tell by the looks on their faces. I can't describe for you the humiliation I felt. This was not Alabama. This was Ohio. I grew up in Ohio. This was Central State University. How could this happen in my state? And how could this happen to me? I picketed. I've picketed. I've marched. I've done all those things. And I thought I understood what all of this felt like but not till it hit me personally. I actually was devastated. The, co the conspiracy around their own consolidation to prevent me from having access to something that they have was just personally devastating, and I was changed forever. It made a huge difference for me. I was never the same after that. I, I moved past bitterness. I am not bitter. But I now understand what disenfranchisement feels like to those who are disenfranchised and not allowed to have the same equality and the same share in the American dream that we all want for everyone. What I hope today, though, is that all of the people that were in that diner have come to, a, to an enlightened viewpoint. I am not angry at any of them. I think they were following the wave of solidarity that was the popular thing at that particular time. Now, I've done di diversity work my whole career, and I never once asked for it. It always fell into my lap, and I embraced it. It may be the very reason that I am here I, in, on the earth. I don't even know that for sure. But I did embrace it, and I feel like I volunteer for that. I happen to be, as, as Melvin has said, the only African-American person who is a department head in Ramsey County. And so I am sometimes in the b position where I have to say things and get things out on the table and put it out into the air for other people to hear that might never be said if I weren't in that room. Sometimes I don't want to. Sometimes I don't want to be that person, but I am that person, and I have to raise my hand, and I have to volunteer, and I have to speak up. I have to speak up for all of you. I have to speak up, you know, for gay rights, for white, you know, white rights, for black rights. I have to speak up for those things. So the first group that I inherited um, in a company, um, I inherited them because I, again, was the only African-American manager in the company, and they asked me to take over the diversity uh, program. There were some people in the company that felt like the company was not going in the right direction, and I was assigned to bring the group along. After several meetings, I received what they thought was their highest compliment. They said, we like you, Patricia. We like working with you and we don't even think of you as a black person. <laughs> well, I knew I had my work cut out for me. <laughs> and that was going to be the first group that I started with. I did say, uh-uh, think of me as a black person. If you don't think of me as a black person, you're going to miss something. You're not going to hear something. You're not going to feel something. Let me be who I am. I'm going to let you be who you are. We are going to work together, and we, will, we are going to make a difference. So allow my worldview to be a lens that you can look through 
and let me look through your world, look through the world through your lens. So uh, now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you on a journey, a pilgrimage uh, that I took. I'm going to invite you to come along with me on this journey, especially you young folks. I want you to come along on this journey. This was my first recognition of a good, positive solidarity in action, and it came to me when I was a child. I didn't even recognize it. There was no word in my vocabulary that covered it at that time, but I was part of a 25,000 to 30,000 person demonstration journeying to the Lincoln Memorial in Washington DC for the prayer pilgrimage for freedom. Uh, there was hours of singing spirituals and there were prayers and there were speeches. It was just like Sunday morning around my house. Uh, but this occasion was designed to to coincide with the third anniversary of Brown versus the Board of Education. This was a landmark decision that's, that where the um, Supreme Court declared that it was unconstitutional to separate black children and white children for education purposes. You guys hear that? Because equal is not separate. It was not separate. It cannot be separate. I'm always going to look in and say, what are they hearing and seeing that I'm not hearing and seeing? And so the Constitution, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court looked at that and said, that's going to be unconstitutional here. This march, however, um, was an attempt to persuade a complacent nation that it had not kept its promises to the black population regarding the 15th Amendment. After the Civil War, three amendments to the Constitution was passed. Um, the 13th Amendment ended slavery, so those folks who were enslaved were allowed to go free. The 14th Amendment made African Americans citizens, and the 15th Amendment gave the right to vote to African American men. Uh, now this was a truly interesting trip for me being, being a child. I had a simple understanding of the issues. Um, all that I understood really was that whites and blacks had different rights. I was a little girl. Uh, they had different rights. Blacks had fewer rights than whites had and were subject to abuse because the laws did not protect us. That was, that's about as simple as you can get and that's about all that I understood. At this time uh, of the pilgrimage, the black church was a very powerful central figure in the life of the black community. My church certainly was. It seemed like we were there all the time. We had the expression that when the, every time the church doors flew open, our family flew in. I see other people saying, yep. You know, we were there Sundays, Wednesdays, Fridays, you know, constantly there at the church. So the organizers of this particular, mar so that my church actually financed my, uh, my trip to go to Washington, D.C. The organizers uh, invited all believers in God, given, in the God-given concept of the brotherhood of man and in the American ideal of equality to assemble to review the national scene, to give thanks for the progress to date, and to pray for wiping out of the evils that still beset our nation. I made this journey by rail. I didn't um, at that time know the history or the struggle of African American men and women um, who were workers on the railroad. How many of you know about those struggles? of African American men and women? Okay, there are a few hands. Okay, school's open. I'm going to tell you about this because I did a little bit of studying on this myself. In 1867, a gentleman by the name of George Pullman, we're familiar with the Pullman cars, introduced his first hotel on wheels. He called it the President. It was a sleeper car and it had an attached kitchen and dining car. The food rivaled the best restaurants any place. As a matter of fact, he had menus designed by the best chefs in the country. A year later, he opened the Delmonico car, uh, rail car, and that one, uh, the chefs that cooked for or that designed the menus there worked for the famous Delmonico restaurant in New York. Both of these offered first rate service. George, I'm going to call him George, George hired almost exclusively. African American freed men as porters. These were men who were domestics and were fresh out of slavery. They were domestics as slaves and so they understood 
how to serve, how to uh, ingratiate yourself. They knew how to do this. And this was George's way of tapping into a workforce that was not unionized. I don't like that. Um, so there were also women. There were also women that freed slavery, freed slaved women who were there to service the needs of the women and the children to, to help them with their personal needs. They were paid relatively well. $3 an hour, that does not sound like very much now, but by our standards, that's about $25 um, uh, in today's money. And the position by black people was considered prestigious because these were people that got to ride around on trains and go all over the country. Never mind that that $3, for those $3, George Pullman required that those who, who, who serviced his cars had to live in Pullman towns. They had towns where the people had to live, they had to do their grocery shopping there, they had to spend their dollars for groceries there, uh, they had to pay for their own uh, shoe shine kits, they had to buy those at the Pullman store, uh, their kids went to the Pullman schools, they went to the Pullman church on Sunday, and the joke among the porters was, when we die, we're going to Pullman hell. <laughs> That's how they felt about this. There were also um, hours and hours of unpaid time because the cars had to be brought up in the morning and set up for the dining, which would happen all day long, and then broken down and, and, and put to bed at night. And if uh, a railroad wanted to buy one of the uh, Pullman cars, what came along with the car was the African freed people to serve. So you got the car and you got the African uh, Americans who served all with all with the same in the same package. So th to me this that felt too much like slavery. Um, so how they got their real money? The real money was from tips. That was really how they made their money because they knew how to work the system with white people and to serve them and they used the tip money to actually do their living. Now these Pullman cars, um, um, let's see. Okay, my grandfather worked on the railroad. I have to tell, this is a slight aside. Um, he, I never heard about any of the, the hardships on the railroad from him. Um, ever. My family actually came north from Alabama where my, my grandfather worked on the railroad and he had to leave there and come north because he refused to allow himself to be abused by a white man. Now I hear that there was some hitting involved but um, I, I, I don't know for sure because he never actually said it but I do know that he paid two men to go down south to get my grandmother and bring her on a train north to him. She was 15 years old at the time. So I digress. I'm going to get back to the journey that we're on. So here I am, a child, riding a train to Washington, D.C., to gather at the Lincoln Memorial for singing, prayer, and for moving the American people um, to, to keep the laws that they had already passed on behalf of the African Americans. On the way though, several cooks came out of the kitchen and they were, they were just gorgeous. They were so beautifully adorned in their suits and they asked permission to take me back into the kitchen to make a sandwich for me and they were given that permission so I accompanied them back. The kitchen was wonderful. It was shiny. They were gracious. I can still remember them pulling out pieces of bacon and they put the bacon on the grill and when the bacon was all done they plopped an egg on top of the bacon and they took out two pieces of white bread Pullman had specially made white bread I got to eat some of that specially made white bread they made that bread into toast and they put grape jelly on it and handed it to me as if it was a precious gift and I received it in the same way I have never had a sandwich quite so good in my whole life that was wonderful Okay, forgive the brief aside. We're still, we're still on this pilgrimage. <laughs> the next day when the march began, uh, people seemed to come from everywhere. To my utter amazement, I saw black people and white people marching arm in arm. I saw Jewish men with their kippahs on. 
I saw pastors in robes. I actually, quite honestly, did not understand what I was seeing. Why would white people be marching for the rights of blacks to vote? Remember, I'm talking about solidarity. Uh, they had the vote. They had the rights. They could eat anywhere they wanted to. They could drink from white-only water fountains. I really pondered that. A and they were marching arm in arm, not just with each other, but with us. They were actually touching us, arm in arm, right along with us. As a little person, I could look up into the faces of these white people, and they looked, they looked kind. Uh, they strolled on with us, singing and talking to each other, and talking with us. And though I had no name for it at the time, I was looking in the face of solidarity. Good solidarity. Nation building solidarity. Person changing solidarity. It was puzzling then, but now it is unequaled in any beauty that I know. Hadn't the organizers called for all believers in the God-given concept of the brotherhood of man and in the American ideal of equity to come to this march? Somehow I hadn't thought of white people as being in that number. As a child, I just hadn't seen that. What a surprise to me. It's amazing what children can conclude on their own without even being, being ta uh, taught. If I can digress for just one more, one, one more time. <laughs> I have a godson. I've been in his life ever since he was born. And, and he's a white child. He's autistic. At about age four, he said to his mother, black people are bad. This is a child that loves me. He said, black people are bad. And she says, no, they're not bad. And he said, yeah, they're bad. Black people are bad. And, and he, she said, Patricia is black. And he said, no. He was vehement that I was not black. When he realized that she must have been telling the truth, he fell in the floor in tears, kicking and screaming. He was inconsolable to think that a person he loved was a black person. He would not be consoled until she called me on the phone and I said to him, Ian, yes, I am black. Ian, it is okay to be black. It is good to be black. I am happy to be black. If I could go back and choose, I would choose to be black. I had to have that kind of conversation with a four-year-old who had been watching too much television, had been probably overhearing people in the street say things that were improper. Well, back to the march. White people, black people together for one purpose, souls still waited, struggling, hoping for the day when we would all come together in solidarity to bring, to, to bring the freedom, dignity, and respect to all fellow human beings. Now, this was the, the first... Um, the first notice of Martin Luther King. He gave a speech there called Give Us the Ballot. It's not as famous as the uh, I Have a Dream speech, but it's very poignant, and I'd like to read a few lines of that from you. Uh, for you. Uh, he cried, Martin Luther King cried over the loudspeaker as only he can. You know, he's got that sing-song voice, and he sounds like he's preaching all the time. And so hear that when I read these words, because I can't talk that way. <laughs> But he said, give us the ballot and we will no longer have to worry the federal government about our basic rights. Give us the ballot and we will no longer plead to the federal government for passage of an anti-lynching an, an anti law. Give us the ballot and we will fight our, fill our legislative halls with men of goodwill. Give us the ballot and we will place judges on the benches in the South who will do justly and love mercy. Give us the ballot and we will quietly and nonviolently and without rancor or bitterness implement the Supreme Court decision of May 17, 1954. This march for solidarity was a march for solidarity and a call out for good men and good women of faith of every color um, to come together and it eventually led to the Voting Rights, Rights Act of 1965. The organizers gained experience during this march and laid the foundation for future marches in the civil rights movement. Now I leave you with this and I really am leaving. 
I see that I'm getting a high sign back there. This from Marion Wright Edelman, who is an African American activist for children's rights. She says, you just need to be a flea against injustice. Enough committed fleas biting even the biggest dog <laughs> will make that dog uncomfortable and could even transform a nation. Thank you.